So yeah, so my name is Kevin Clues. Uh, I, my background, when I, I work at Mesosphere, so most of the stuff we're gonna be showing in this tutorial is around DCOS, not necessarily just Mesos and Mesos specific. Uh, we're all employees of Mesosphere. Uh, when I first joined the company, I was working on the Mesos core subsystem, the, the Mesos, uh, you know, Mesos containerizer. I added some GPU support to Mesos and, and things along those lines. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, though, is the, the, the task exec support that I added. So the ability to sort of mimic the same functionality you get from something like Docker Attach or Docker Exec, but adding that capability to Mesos so you can go ahead and uh, debug your applications when, once you launch them. Um, so why don't I let these guys introduce themselves as well, and then we'll jump into the presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Johannes. I'm also working for Mesosphere. I'm working in the Marathon Project. Um, I'm the speaker. Yeah, and I'm really happy to show you uh, today all about uh, Marathon and networking options you have when you use Marathon, and especially when you use DCRs on top. Hello, my name is Gaston. Uh, when I joined Mesosphere, I worked first on Marathon and a bit of Kronos, and nowadays I mostly focus on, I'm in the core team, so mostly on Mesos and the default executor health checks and stuff like that. And that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name's Philip Norman. I work on the metrics project in DCOS and I also run the Day2 Ops working group. I don't know if anyone's here from there, but if you are, hi. Um, okay, back to you, Kevin. I think the feedback was coming from that other microphone, so I'm gonna see how I do with, with this one. Um, so just a quick sort of intro before we jump into the, the main topics. Um, as most of you probably know, deploying to production can be pretty hard when you're trying to run something on as sophisticated, as sophisticated of a system as, as Mesos and all the other moving parts that come along with that. But it really doesn't have to be. And you know, when you do finally get to the point of deploying something to production, if things go wrong, it's not always obvious to figure out how to deal with those problems, right? So our goal of this tutorial is really twofold. We want to teach you how to get your applications ready for production, how do you configure them so that you can actually deploy them on a Mesos DCOS cluster. Um, so that they can run in a production environment, and then show you some of the best practices for debugging your applications you know, when things inevitably go wrong during that process, right? So you know, we wanna move you from this, from this point of things being hard to move you to the point of things being at least a little bit easier. Um, just a quick rundown of the different topics that we're gonna go through in this. So uh, Johannes is gonna start off uh, talking about container networking. How do you configure the different settings in, in your container so that you can launch them and have the, you know, the right network networking between them for service discovery and things like this. Uh, Gaston's then gonna jump into some of the health check work that we've, that we've put together recently, um, and including readiness checks to you know, check the health of your applications to figure out if there's something wrong so that you can eventually then go in and try and debug that. Uh, Johannes is then going to talk again about uh, debugging deployment. So if you have problems when you actually go through the deployment phase of launching it via, via Marathon, what goes wrong, how can you figure out what's wrong and then fix it. Uh, then Philip's going to jump in and talk about some of the best, pack, best practices around uh, using our metrics and logging services that we have in DCOS um, and how to actually get the most useful information about in, uh, from those logs and metrics in order to debug things that are going wrong. And then I'll uh, conclude with uh, uh, so an overview of how to use this new attach exec support that we built in so that you can you know, launch a remote shell inside a container, figure out things that are going wrong, debug that, and then you know, get the thing running again uh, if, 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 you know, after, after you've diagnosed what was wrong in the first place. Uh, and then after that, we'll jump into an uh, interactive session with you guys. So we've set up a DCOS cluster. Uh, we've, given, we've created a bunch of user accounts on that, and all of the, all of the scripts and all of the uh, configuration files that we, that we put together that we'll be showing during these, the different parts of this talk will make available via GIST so that you can try and deploy them and play around with them and use some of the debugging tools that, we've, that, we, that we demonstrate to you. You can play around with that yourself, right? Okay, so here's Johannes. Yeah, so before we're talking about production, we need to make sure that our services like knows each other. So when you're having a service which don't expose uh, expose a, so a port or don't consume a port, it's basically something that runs but don't have interaction with others. But usually you're building like a service oriented architecture with some microservices and data services and you need to make sure that you have producers offering services and they need to define a name or whatever to expose those services and on the other hand you have consumers who wants to 
talk to those services. And the first thing, or what, what I saw when I uh, was a user of these kind of services was that you have like hard-coded dependencies on names where you want to connect to, but when you have a highly distributed and highly dynamic system like DCS and all the services on top, you need to make sure that you are able to dynamically change those configurations and make it uh, configurable from the outside. So again, I'm from the Marathon team, so everything I show you today is basically this Marathon JSON configuration. And in Marathon for an application, this would look like something like this. You have an environment property in your app definition, and you say, my database URI should be something like this. And you see that here's a symbolic name configured, like database on some random port for the MySQL database. But how we, do we get there that we have those kind of symbolic names where we can connect to? So if you're using Mesos Marathon and especially ECS, you have a couple of options to, to solve this problem. So the, the first and probably um, um, oldest and established uh, solution was Mesos DNS. So when you launch a task in Marathon, you get a proper DNS name for the task and all running services for this. But this is done via surf records, so DNS surf records. So this is really, really easy for the uh, producer of a service because you don't care about configuring something in your Marathon applications. It's just there when Mesos DNS is running. But the downside is that only a few applications can handle those surf records, and it's like, not, not really low balance, so you need to connect all those together and it's done by your own. And if we go to what is exposed, it's probably like this. So our application is service one, it's the app ID in Marathon, and if you're using this, you get the DNS name, service1.marathon.mesos. And the, if you do a, a simple dig on this, you get those one IP address back. But if you have two services on the same host name running, you get only one entry. So you can do a dig for surf records, and then you get additionally the host port of this. But again, so you don't have load balancing, so no automatic load balancing on this, and in most systems don't understand surf records. So we can use a second version of this. So we can use virtual IPs, and the underlying technology we use in DCS is Minuteman. So what do you do with DCS? You say on the producer side that you want to exp export the service, like a host name and port combination. And uh, Minuteman makes sure that there's a load balancer in place and you can connect to those symbolic name and port combination. And you, you're not only restricted to symbolic names, you could also use IP patterns for this. But uh, the downside is you need to install Minuteman or like use DCS, so it's pre-packaged in DCS. You, if you're using DCS, you don't worry about anything, and you have some DNS suffix. So I show you what I mean with this. So on the producer side, you go to a Marathon app definition and configure a port mapping. You say you want to export uh, your container port 3306, and you can define labels. So the first label, VIP0, is a symbolic name. You can say, I want to export database on that port, and every traffic in this DCS cluster on this host name port combination is mapped to a load balanced a version of those marathon applications. And the same is true for these IP patterns. So you can define a virtual IP, but when you're using virtual IPs, you, like, you need to talk to other people in your team, making sure that this IP is not used by anyone else and stuff like this. So you, I, I would use like this symbolic, um, uh, symbolic version. And then, as consumer, you can use something like this. You can, if you're having, like, want to connect your database, just configure your JDBC string as 3306 on port 3306, and you're done. Um, if you have a database who supports load balancing. Um, if not, you're only able to start one application, basically. And on the top, you see what I saw, uh, what I uh, named the DNS suffix. So if you exposing the database symbolic name, you get the uh, suffix marathon.l4lb.thisdcs.directory. This is something you need to know, but when you're used to it, you can define between uh, this virtual IP, a service discovery option, and the others uh, the I, I show you now. So the last one is virtual networks. 
And in DCOS, we use Navstar for this. And which of networks basically is you configure that your container should join an overlay network. And this container will join this network and will have every, I will have a, a IP per container, so a dedicated IP for this container, and every port is exposed. So you don't need to do some magic um, port mappings or stuff like this. Everything is open for this. So if you have technologies who rely on starting a service on a certain port, like, let's say 8080 for some traditional Java applications, and you are not able to change this port for this application, um, because like the application is crashes otherwise, this is a good way to like have an own IP for your servers, exposing 8080, and you're done. And again, like you need to have Navstar or DCS, and also have a different DNS suffix for this kind of things. Okay, this would be look like in Marathon. So we'd configure an application with the ID database and say, I, this container should have an IP address and it's coming from the overlay network, DCOS. And I want to have two instances now because I want to show you how this would look like when I do a dig on this. So if I now do a dig, so now I have database.marathon.containerip.dcs.thisdcs.directory. So it gets a little bit longer now. You would get the following answer. You could, would get um, two answers for an A record, DNS A record. Again, with the whole like um, host name over there. Uh, it was too long for the slide, so I like added three dots. You would get database, blah, 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 directory, and then get uh, two IPs for your two containers for this. <clears throat> OK. so. This is what we offer as like basic set for networking and services covering options and DCS. But you can bring your own technologies. Like our console is a, is a great services recovery technology and is used by, by many companies and really popular. So there's a installation where you can um, install console in your DCS cluster and use this for services recovery. And if you don't like Napster, you could also use uh, WeForWorks um, container networking. Uh, solutions. So this is really open to like to go for your own networks and own uh, services recovery tools if you want to. Okay, and I think when we're talking about health checks uh, and networking, I think the next. Oh, Gaston, I think you can just. I want to hand over to you now. When we're talking about networks and production ready, you probably want to configure health checks to your applications, and Gaston will tell you about. Yeah. So before I start talking about health checks, I would want to know uh, a bit more about you. So can you please raise your hands if you have ever used Mesos or Marathon before? OK. And how many of you have deployed anything in production? Or using this in production? OK, it's about one third of the room or something like that. Um, <laughs> so whenever you deploy an application, uh, it's pretty easy for Mesos and for you to find out if the application is dead and if it crashes. Uh, because then Marathon will simply restart it, or whatever scaler you're using will restart it. Uh, but what happens if your application gets stuck in, in a loop, or cannot reach a database, or something like that, and it doesn't exit? Uh, it will still be up and running, so Mesos might think it's okay, and it will not be restarted. Um, and it will still not serve what you want, so you have to somehow detect that condition, and. Uh, React and probably restart the tasks. So how can you do that? How can you detect that? Well, that's where health checks come into play. Um, if you use health checks, uh, then either Marathon or Mesos, depending on the kind of health checks that you're using, will probe your application periodically, your, your tasks. Uh, could be either via HTTP or TCP or running commands in the same namespaces as your application, as, as your tasks. And then Mesos or Marathon will keep track of how many failures there were. And if your task fails the probes uh, a certain amount of times that you can define, then it will be killed. And Marathon will replace them, or whatever other framework will replace them. So if your application crashes by itself whenever there's a failure, and you are 100% sure that that's going to happen, then you need health checks. Uh, but normally, that's not the case. Normally, yeah, 
it can hang, or maybe there's there are some connectivity issues or something like that, and then you will want to use health checks. Um, there's when you define health check, you can define uh, the protocol that would, that's again HTTP, TCP, or command, and depending on the protocol that you're going to use, then you have you can define the command to run or the port to connect to or the path to use when doing an HTTP request. Uh, something important to set and to, that you have to dis decide when you're writing your app definition is how often uh, your application will be probed. And you also define a timeout because it might be that your application hangs forever answering a request, so you only want to give it some time and then if that passes, uh, you will consider that check failed. Another imp important thing is the grace period. Uh, Marathon and Mesos will not consider f failing uh, checks as uh, failures during that grace period. That gives your application some time to uh, initialize and listen on the part that it has to listen to, stuff like that. So the first failures will be ignored until the application either succeeds uh, a check or the grace period passes. And another very important one is the maximum consecutive failures that you want to allow. That's uh, Marathon will keep track of how many times your application failed, uh, health checks, and if it reaches that number, then that task will be killed, uh, and another one will replace it. So if you configure this on your application, then you're certain that it will not hang in a loop or something like that, that it will be replaced. Um, and also the state of, of the health check is exposed through different APIs. Uh, and then your load balancing solution can look into that and decide where it's, it wants to start serving traffic or not. Um, besides uh, health checks, there's something else that Marathon offers called readiness checks. It's easy to confuse what the, what the differences are between the, those two, so I will explain again why we have that and how they work. Um, yeah, let, let's say that your task is up and running. But at the beginning, it needs to warm up. It needs to load stuff, uh, populate the cache, or something like that. Um, and your load balancer uh, needs to know when it's ready, or Marathon also needs to know when it's ready. Let's say you're upgrading an application. It needs to know when that task is up and running so you can kill one of the old ones. Um, and how can you detect that? So you can use something very similar to what we did before, so use uh, readiness checks. Again, your application should expose through an endpoint or you can run a command or something like that. And Marathon will probe that endpoint. So in this case, I'm only talking about Marathon, not Marathon and Mesos, uh, because Marathon right now doesn't support me uh, Mesos checks. That's something that was as added recently. Um, so yeah, I, for when you're using readiness checks, it's all done just by Marathon. Uh, Marathon will connect to you, try to connect to your tasks and will evaluate the result, but if those checks fail, it won't kill the task. That's, that's the main difference between a health check and a readiness check. If a health check fails n number of times, then Marathon will kill the task and replace it with something else. Uh, but if readiness checks are failing, Marathon will just not continue deploying your application. It will wait for the task to be ready and then continue. So if readiness checks are failing, you will observe your deployment that it will get stuck, but your task will not be killed. So what you can configure here is similar to what you can do with health checks. The same protocols are supported, HTTP, TCP, and command. You can also define how often and set a timeout. The main difference is that there's no grace period because there's no like, if it's failing at the beginning, then Martha will just wait longer. Uh, so there's no need to give it a grace period. And again, because it will not kill anything, we'll just only wait for the first successful probe. Uh, there's no need to set any maximum consecutive for failures. Uh, something that I forgot to say before is that uh, Marathon will stop doing readiness checks as soon as uh, the first one passes. So it's just uh, there to have Marathon wait a bit longer. Uh, and make sure that it doesn't kill your existing tasks before the, the new ones that it just launched are ready. Um, I, I mentioned that th these things can be done either by Mesos or by Marathon, so I wanted uh, 
go into some implementation details that might help you define what's better for you. So yeah, the tasks can be brought by a scheduler that would be Marathon or Aurora or something else. Uh, so that, that means remotely. Or the Mesos built-in executors also support health checks. And they can do the health checks locally and then send the framework the results. Um, yeah. And when you create your application, you can, when you write your application, you can choose uh, which approach you, you want to use. If you want to use, for example, HTTP uh, checks, health checks, then you can use either HTTP as a protocol. That's, that means that Marathon will do the HTTP checks. Or you can use Mesos underscore HTTP. They work in the same way, but it's Mesos now doing the health checks uh, locally on the agent. And that has implications that we will see in the next slides. Um, so there are some issues uh, where, with checks originating from the scaler from Marathon. One of them is that. Uh, well, the API for health checks varies from one framework to the next, but that doesn't matter here because we're focusing mostly on, on marathons, so we can ignore that part. Uh, one of the main problems is that in marathon, health checks are always performed by the leader, so you always have one node who's trying to connect to all your tasks. So if you have a big number of tasks, uh, it will generate a lot of extra network traffic, uh, and that can be a bottleneck. Uh, and also written of failure. Um, again, because Marathon will try to connect to all the tasks uh, across your cluster, if there's any network failure between separating Marathon from your tasks, uh, the health checks will fail. But that doesn't mean that your tasks are not healthy. It could be that there's a network partition or something like that that's harmless for users and only affects the connectivity within Marathon and the nodes. Um, so it can give you false positives or well, negatives, like unhealthy things. Um, and we did some scale tests uh, after, we, after I added support for Mesos health checks. And they scale much better than Marathon health checks because, again, you can distribute the load horizontally across your agents. Each agent checks its own tasks, and that scales better. Um, so, yeah, so to solve those, those issues, we introduced Mesos native health checks. Uh, if you use them, then the health checking is not centralized. It's done by every agent that runs your tasks. Um, it scales better. You can use command checks. Command checks always run on, on the agent anyways. Uh, there's no way of making Marathon run a command on, on the task. So it's, that's, that has always been delegated to the nodes. Uh, but in starting with Mesos 1.3, also HTTP and TCP health checks run, run on the agents. Um, and all built-in executors support all of these checks, the Docker executor, the regular Mesos executor, uh, well, command executor is, is a name, and also the new default executor is mostly used for pods, uh, but most frameworks and workloads are migrating to it. Um, there are some limitations with Mesos hash checks anyways. Um, well, more than limitations, like uh, trade-offs. Since they run now on the agents, they consume more resources on the, on the agents. So you need to prepare for that and reserve extra resources for them. Normally, they should be lightweight, but in the case of command hash checks, you can run any command. So if you run something very expensive, it will run in the same namespaces as, as your task, so it could potentially starve it. Uh, so you should be careful and either allocate more resources or use lightweight checks and lightweight commands. Um, they always connect to localhost in the case of HTTP and, HTTP and TCP checks. So your application must always listen on localhost. Um, the advantage is that they are not uh, vulnerable to network glitches or stuff like that. But you have to make sure that your application listens on that IP. Um, and because Mesos will fork processes to run those checks, it includes some overhead. Uh, so yeah, again you have to plan for that and make sure that your agents have enough capacity for that. Um, well, uh, I, I want to make a short demo of how, how they work. Uh, I will just scream because uh, I need both hands to type and I cannot use this microphone. <laughs> so actually, 
Let me go to the last slide. So we have a cluster set up that you can use at the end to try these things out. I'm going to use the same cluster to do this demo. Um, it's a DCOS cluster. I'm going to connect to it first. It's a live demo, so things can go wrong. Hopefully not. <laughs> Connectivity seems to be quite slow. <laughs> Okay, so I'm logged in as, as admin. Uh, what I'm going to do is I have a very demo, very small demo application that you can deploy on any cluster or even run it locally. It has a web server and exposes two endpoints, one for hash checks, one for ANS checks. And we can see details about the requests to those uh, things, and we can also make them fail. And then we can see how Marathon and Mesos react to those failures. Uh, I'm going to first deploy a basic version of that. Have a JS with the JSON ready. You will be able to use this again uh, at the end and play with it a bit. So let me quickly deploy the basic application first. So it's a Docker container that you, uh, listens on a fixed port and then that's exposed uh, in a dynamic port in, in Marathon. That's what this host port zero does. And we have Marathon LB running on this cluster and Marathon LB will let you get to this application uh, through the public IP. I have to set here uh, the port that it will listen on so that we can easily find it. So we're saying that it should listen on port 80. And I'm missing a closing. Thank you, Johannes. <laughs> uh, so we're going to run this. It should deploy pretty quickly. It doesn't say it's healthy because we didn't add any health checks there. It only says that it's running. So now I'm going to connect to it. Let me get the IP of the public agent. OK. So. This is the application. It's very simple. You can go to health checks and say that the next end should fail or not. And if you go to healthy endpoint, then you can see that someone did a request, which IP it came from, and which result we, we returned. Um, yeah, so I'm going to use this and set it to fail in the first end checks. And then we can see how that affects Marathon. Let's do this quick, quickly. I'm I'm going to use an Arab definition that they have ready. Well, basically, we can use the same one and just add health checks, basically. Um. So we're adding here some arguments that will make it fail the first three checks. We're going to use Mesos uh, checks, so we will see that the ch checks are coming from local hosts, from the agent. Um, here we set the path. It's healthy, slash healthy. Uh, we are not giving, going to give it any, any grace period, so if it fails from the beginning, then it will be killed. Uh, and we're going to make the checks every five seconds. Uh, so I expect this to, I expect expect Marathon to kill the application after 15 seconds because we are telling it to fail the first three checks and we're not giving it any grace period. Let's see if it works. Uh, that's probably something you don't want in production. You don't want this to happen to you because this means that the deployment will never succeed. Uh, after 15 seconds, your task will be killed. So we can discuss or I can show you how to fix that. Uh, so you can see that the task is running and now it's considered unhealthy and it will be killed soon and replaced by another one. We have to refresh it. So yeah, so this is not longer in unhealthy because it, there's another application now. If you see all of them, one was killed, that was the failing one, and it was replaced by another one. And this will happen all the time because we're not giving your application enough time, or yeah, we're not 
waiting long enough for it to become healthy. So if we want to fix this situation, what we have to do is just increase the grace period. Uh, so in, in this case, we're making it fail only three times. Uh, so if we wait, and we're, we're checking every five seconds, so if we wait at least 15 seconds, then you, your application will be healthy and then your deployment should succeed. Um, so just to be sure, I will change this to 20 seconds, not 15 seconds, but 15 should be enough. Let's deploy this and then wait for the application to become healthy. Afterwards, uh, you can play with the clusters and we can also play with readiness checks and see how instead of killing the task, uh, Marathon will just wait for it. But that's something you can do by yourself. You can play with that later. So we can see it, it failed checks, but if we wait long enough, they will pass. So we can go to the application again. Let you close it. But first we have to wait until the application is deployed and the container is fetched and that stuff. And we can see it is now passing checks. So the first three failed, but then it's now passing checks. And if we look now in the DCOS UI, we can see it's healthy and then the deployment is succeeded. The application is up and running. And yeah. I, I could make it, well, yeah, we, we can wait 20 seconds. So I, I can make it fail the next five checks. Uh, and then in 15 seconds, this task should be gone, should be killed by, by Marathon. We can see that it went unhealthy. Uh, in the meantime, this, this could mean that your application in production, for example, is not responding to requests. So it will take a few seconds, depending on your settings, to detect that. But now you can see Marathon detected that. And now it's running another instance and waiting for it to be, get healthy. And that's pretty much uh, yeah, the demo. Um, oh, let's, let's stay to DCS UI, maybe. OK. So um, if, if you're at that point, you're really happy. So Mesos and Marathon was able to start your applications, but sometimes you have a problem that you have a starving deployment and your applications never get launched. And in Marathon 1.4, uh, we introduced a nice feature to like make it a little bit more easy to you to debug these kind of situations. And when you start a service and uh, start a new one and say we call it Service one, and we say a simple sleep, sleepy application, and no con Docker container, something involved. But you accidentally said that you want to have 10 CPUs for this application. So what happens, Marathon will wait until Marathon one will receive an offer containing 10 CPUs. But it's really like, unlikely in this cluster that this will ever happen. So we see that we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting like to Christmas for this. And um, what, what we introduced in Marathon, we introduced a REST API where you can inspect the current deployments. And when you have a DCS cluster, you can go to uh, Marathon and go to service, service Mar uh, V2Q. Let me do oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's missing an H. Okay, so what you will see is uh, that you have a pretty nice formatted JSON file, and you see the processed offers Marathon has seen. So you see a summary of the last offers. So you see that you received six offers in in the last time, and one was declined because of an unmatching role. So in this cluster, we do have uh, seven agents six private ones and one public ones, probably. No, five private ones and one public, so six in total. And you're constantly declining one because it's the public agent, the wrong role. And no uh, offer was declined because of an unfulfilled constraint, and so on and so forth. And you have constantly declined offers because the CPU count is not matching. So this is a summary of the last offer cycle of your cluster. And on the other side, you get an aggregated view on your uh, launch attempts, on your, on your offers you saw. 
And like when I would refresh it now, uh, the number of processed offers would be increased. And you see that you in total saw 18 offers and you declined three because of the role and so on. And you saw 15 offers and declined all 15 of them because of the unmatching CPU, um, configured CPUs. So if you see this, it's probably really easy for, for you as developer or an administrator to like go into and see, oh, I need to fix the CPU count to get this application running. And the great thing is, oops, you don't need to, if you're using DCS, you don't need to um, go to the REST API to see this. There's a proper UI for this. And also a, a good a CLI, um, CLI interpretation of this. So when we go to the UI, you need to go to the debug tab, and then you see these summary, offer, um, summary uh, of offers, you see the declination because of the role, and really present the, uh, the decline because of the CPUs. And like this table uh, showing all your nodes, and you see that you have all the red crosses on the CPU column. So it's really obvious that to fix the CPU on this side. And we go back to the slides. Um, this is also in, in the slides. Um, let's check. Implementation. Yeah, this one. And if you would use the CLI, thank you very much, um, you could do DCS Marathon debug list, and then you get an overview of all your applications Marathon is currently trying to start. Um, in an example, it's a CPU task, you want to launch one instance, and you're waiting, and you processed six offers and didn't use anything of that. And if you go to details and then enter the app ID, you get the same table in CLI as you would see in the, in the UI. Okay, so this is like, if you're having a stuck deployment and don't know why. Oh, we, see, we have a question. Okay, so the question was, uh, if, if we would add a CPU count to this table as an overview. GPU, GPU yeah, GPUs. Um, so there was a uh, GPU feature um, in, in, the, in the past. Um, so if you're using the, uh, the REST endpoint, there are GPUs listed as well, as well as if an offer is declined because you don't have the needed resource, um, resource reservations for this, if you're using like local uh, persistent volumes and stuff like this. Um, I think it's, uh, there's an Jira, a Jira ticket op, uh, open to add GPUs as well. So GPUs is fully supported, the calculation is everything in place. I think it's just not displayed currently in the CLI. Okay, thank you. Great. Logging and metrics. Oh, if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and shoot. Okay, thank you. Cool, hey everybody. Um, so yeah, metrics and logging. Um, so the first kind of question is like, what, what are they for, what are they good for, and what's the difference? Because um, they're both kind of like outputs from your application. Um, and they're both timestamped and they both provide some insight into how your application's performing. Um, so I just wanted to call out a couple of differences before diving into how they, how they might work. Um, logs are specific and metrics are ge uh, generic. So a log might say something like a user logged in and this is their ID, uh, whereas a metric might be, uh, for, for the same event, might be this many users logged in in the last minute. Uh, logs are generally text, uh, metrics are generally numeric, so um, it's reasonable for me to go and read a log file, but it's kind of unreasonable for me to go and read a whole heap of metrics. Um, so I'm going to want them pre-processed somehow first. And um, uh, there is one particular thing that they have in common, and that's that you can monitor off them. You can monitor your application um, by looking at their outputs. Um, so a metric might help you detect an outlier when your application's performing weirdly. Um, you, you kind of hope that your metric's always going to be pretty dull, 
Uh, if you're doing a lot of batch processing, you might see peaks, sustained peaks, and then back down again. And if you're running a social network, you're going to see like a spike at 11 AM and a spike at 4 PM, because uh, people don't like working. And it's when you see a deviation from that pattern that you know that you've got an exception emerging. Um, and if you get smart with your error bounds, you can, uh, you can uh, have a situation where something develops, and before anything catches fire at all, you know that something's going to go wrong, and you can get in there and be fixing it before that happens. Um, and so you can catch things like your disks are filling up uh, with logs um, before your disks completely fill up and freeze everything up. And logs help you debug exceptions. So after something's occurred, you can go in and look at a particular um, a particular event. So in this case, uh, somebody from Chrome OS logged in and looked at groups in Marathon, and I know their IP address, and I know exactly what they did to cause whatever, whatever happened next. Um, but you have a problem, and that's that there are a lot of logs. This is the output. <laughs> this is regular output from a node that's not doing all that much, um, which I, uh, I, I took this gift this morning. Um, and so you're just looking at a lot of data when you're, when you're looking through your logs. And picking exceptions out um, can be pretty hard. Um, so we give you some tools to help a little bit uh, in, in Mesos and DCOS. Uh, on the left, we have the output from the um, CLI when you're calling out one particular instance, saying, OK, what, what's happened with that? And on the right, we have the um, same logs spooling through the UI. But so far, what I've, what I've told you isn't particularly new. It's like probably familiar to everybody. And um, if you're familiar with the Mesos logs interface, this is, this is pretty much the same thing. Um, so I wanted to speak to what, what DCOS can do a bit more. Um, Mesos has no built-in log DB. It just writes to file and pages, and pages through those like a regular, um, like a regular application. Um, and DCOS also has no LogDB out of the box, but what it does have is the ability to install services like Elastic, Kibana, and Logstash, which is the ELK stack, um, and easy integration with things like Splunk. And so that's kind of cool, because once you've got um, your application piped out to ELK or Splunk or whatever, uh, you can start to write queries like this. Um, so what we've done here, that the highlighted bit is a framework ID and we've searched for every log related to that framework. Now, that's cool because um, that framework might have uh, processes running on multiple nodes. Um, and with, uh, by, by searching the specific ID, um, we can get those without having to pull a load of log files and do that, that thing manually. So much for logs. Um, metrics are important. They're the first thing you see when you log into DCOS, the dashboard. Um, shows you these, these graphs, but those graphs are allocation. That's what Mesos knows about what it's trying to do at this moment. Um, so if we're going to be responsible cluster operators, we need to look a little bit deeper than that. Um, but there's loads of different types of metric. Uh, this is an attempt to um, explain the uh, architecture of the metrics project itself and calling out the three different types, um, which are uh, metrics from the node, metrics from the containers running in Mesos, and metrics from the apps running inside those. Um, so this is um, Prometheus. There's a, what we've just queried node CPU. It's, it's right at the top of that, of that slide, you can see. And this is a smallish cluster. And these are the, the CPU utilization per node um, at, uh, over the last, I think this is a two hour query. Um, so again, so far, so normal. Um, this is something that you can probably get out of um, AWS or GC or whatever, whatever you're using to deploy your machines. Um, but we have more than that. We have container level metrics. Um, these are kind of similar. They, they look at first glance kind of similar to node metrics because you're looking at the same kind of, um, kind of, kind of fields like CPU, like memory, like disk consumption, network. Um, but they are slightly different because um, they are operating within constraints. So when, when you're looking at your node metrics, you might say, OK, if my CPU rises above 80% um, of available resource, then I've probably got a problem. Or if my disk gets completely full, then I've definitely got a problem. So you're going to set some overhead in your constraints. Whereas when you're working with a container, um, you've constrained it already. So if it's using 100% of CPU, you're not necessarily locking anything up. Although you do still want to monitor this stuff because it, it's probably not great. And you probably need to increase your allocation of resource there. Um, 
And the last one is app level metrics. Now, these are the metrics that your app um, emits from within its container. Um, and what you're looking at here is um, many processes running a, a HTTP server, and this is the latency on the requests to those servers. So you can, you can see all of them stacked up there, and you can see a point at which um, latency suddenly rose and a point where it suddenly dropped. Um, so alerting is the last thing I wanted to talk to because um, you're going to want to alert from your logs, from your metrics. Um, they're both important, and you can't, you can't really just pick one. Um, if you start seeing many um, exceptions in your logs, then you're going to want to get paged. Um, if you start seeing very high traffic from your, monitor, from your metrics, you want to get paged. If you start seeing very low traffic, you really, really, really want to get paged because something's gone down. Um, so I just wanted to, to say briefly, there's this, this concept of white box metrics and black box metrics. A white box metric is when you have full visibility into your app and um, something like Cassandra, for example, will give you, uh, will start to emit metrics about the state of the JVM it's running on. So that's kind of cool. Like I, I know exactly how much heap space I'm currently consuming and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but I also want to know whether I can still write to it. So a black box metric is, um, you know, can I actually access the site? It's from the user's pers uh, a metric from the user's perspective. Um, kind of similar to what Gaston and Johannes were just uh, talking about with health checks there. Um, so yeah, do both. Um, and that's sort of, oops, that was the wrong screen. Um, <laughs> That was that's pretty much what I've got for you. That was a quick charge through. Um, that was a very screenshot heavy um, few slides, but uh, everything I've shown you there was deployed on a DCOS cluster, um, and that's all like very very achievable today. So, yeah, I'll hand over to Kevin again. Oh, sorry, we have a question. Go ahead. Uh, the question was: Is the Prometheus plugin baked into 110? Um, the uh, no, not, it's not actually baked in. You have to deploy it on top. Okay. Um, but go ahead. So the question was, if you're using the Docker agent and you deploy the Fluent D logger, does that prevent logs showing up in the UI? It shouldn't, no. Um, because as far as I know, that does not divert them, and they should still be um, they should still be written out to um, yeah no they should still be available, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Or can I uh, shall I hand over? Okay, over to Kevin. All right, thanks, Philip. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the attach and exec support that we added into DCOS. So it's basically mimicking the same kind of exec, uh, attach and exec that you would get if you were trying to use the, the Docker CLI, but now add it into for support with Mesos. Um, so a quick overview of what we did to add the support. Um, like I said, it's added functionality to Mesos to enable building tools that mimic the functionality of Docker attach and Docker exec. So you can jump inside your containers, uh, debug what's going wrong, and then come back out. Um, everything runs locally on your client, so with this support, there's no need to SSH onto the node where your task is running. You can just jump right into the container itself uh, from, your, from your local laptop. Uh, we have a reference implementation of you know, wrapping the APIs that we had to add to Mesos to, to, to build the support in the DCOS CLI. So if you wanted to invoke this to actually you know, take advantage of this new support, you would run something like DCOS task exec, say whether you wanted it to be interactive, attach a TTY or not, pass the task ID, the command you want to run, any of the arguments and so on. So we really tried to mimic the exact same command line that you would have from a Docker exec, but wrapping it for, for, for DCOS. Um, and then similarly for uh, attach, which is implemented on the API side inside Mesos, but we haven't pushed that through to have it be supported in the, in the CLI yet, but it is coming soon. Uh, and also native Mesos CLI support for this is coming soon as well. You know, we built the support into Mesos. It's obviously usable by a Mesos CLI. We just haven't uh, prioritized building that, that piece of it yet as a, f from the company's perspective. Um, so what do the exec commands really do? What do they allow you to do? You know, they, they basically, um, under the hood, if you look at the implementation details of this, we leverage the nested container support that we added to Mesos. Uh, nested containers is also the same technology that we built to allow us to support something like pods, similar to what you get from Kubernetes. We call them task groups 
Kubernetes calls them pods, but under the hood in Mesos, they're all nested containers. Uh, the one difference, or the one piece that we had to add to our existing nested container support was that we had to be able to tie the life cycle of the nested container to the life cycle of a connection. So whenever we do one of these task execs into the container, we launch a nested container inside of it with a brand new process. It runs until that connection is dropped, and then that container gets killed and cleaned up and kind of disappears, right? Um, when this process is launched inside there, we, you know, we isolate the nested container inside the same set of C groups and namespaces as the parent container. So, you know, logically, all you're doing is launching a new process inside the container. But what you really need to do to make this robust and usable is launch a separate container that just happens to have all the same C groups and namespaces as the original container, right? Um, and then once you have that, we just stream the input and output of the command back to the local terminal. And we use uh, HTTP, so it's all streaming HTTP. There's not a TCP connection that we set up, which makes it a lot more flexible to be able to use from a UI, from your CLI, from everything, because there's nice tools you can do just around the HTTP. Um, so similarly for attach commands, so if you think of exec as launching a new process inside your container, attach is and then, you know, exec is launching a new process and then attaching to the, the standard in and standard out to stream that back. Attach is just getting to the standard in and standard out of your primary uh, process inside your container, right? So once you launch that initial container, you just want to be able to get at its uh, output or feed something into its input, right? That's the purpose of something like attach. Um, and uh, currently, even with the support that we have for Mesos, we... Um, and, and going forward, we're only going to allow people to attach to containers that have been pre-launched with a TTY. So when you set up your container and you're about to launch it, one of the fields in your container config can be, oh, I want a TTY attached to this. And then under the hood, the containerizer will allocate a TTY for it, stream all of this, the input and output through that TTY so that you can come along later and attach to it. And the main reason we did this is that we, to, to, uh, when I get into the implementation details of it in a second, you'll see... Uh, kind of how this is architected, but you know, we really want these things to be able to, uh, to you know, we want the containers themselves to survive agent crashes. We want everything to be really robust. So in order to implement the support for being able to attach to its input and output, we have to run a separate process alongside any of our tasks that we launch. And so we didn't want to make force every user that ever launches a task to have this separate sidecar process associated with it. So we decided to limit the scope of this to only if you want a TTY attached to it, well, you get this extra process kind of launched alongside it so you can come and attach to it later. Um, so this is kind of the architecture of what we did. So the, 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 the boxes in blue are pieces that existed prior to this work, and the orange ones are the things that we added. So if I start on the left here, uh, you can see that, you know, the main thing we did is we added some new agent APIs. And I'll get into what the details of, the, of what those APIs are in a second. But the idea is that they're just some APIs that you can attach directly to an agent to stream input and output out of a container, right? Um, we had to have a, add a component uh, for the handlers for those, for those API calls, which now call into something that we, uh, that we created called the container IO switchboard, um, which, you know, it has a component that lives inside the agent, but its entire job is basically to, you know, both launch a new Mesos I.O. switchboard process and glue the standard in and standard out between the I.O. switchboard process and the task that's actually being launched. Because the I.O. switchboard is the thing that you're actually going to connect to to get the, to make that connection with the input and output. And so there's, a, you know, there's a, basically just a bunch of file descriptor and pipes that are set up to make sure that, you know, the, the I.O. switchboard, you know, gets your input and output, make sure that you can feed that from the connection and then also write that to the application properly. Does that make sense? Um, and what the API calls actually look like are, are this. So there's three calls. Uh, one of them is called launch nested container session. And the purpose of that is to, you know, you pass it your task ID and you tell it what new command you want to run inside that. It then launches the new nested container inside your container on the agent and it sits there and it's waiting for the next command. And so the next command that you want to be able to send it is container input. So you can start streaming your input into that container. Now, the third one we have is called attached container output. Um, nested, launch nested container session actually uh, overloads the attached container output, so you only really need the attached container output call if you're doing an attach rather than an exec, because what ends up happening for launch nested container session is you, know, you open a new connection into the agent, that connection stays alive forever, and then the, the response that comes back is just a streaming output from the container that you've that you've now launched, right? The, whatever command you've launched, once that connection happens, you start getting an infinite stream of the output coming back. Um, 
if you come along later and do an attached container input, now you can, you know, you have a persistent connection on the request where you're constantly streaming your, your input into the application. And then similarly with the attached container output, it's the exact same thing going on in terms of streaming output that you get from launch nested container session, except you don't actually launch a nested container, right? You just attach to the uh, output of whatever the container uh, primary process already was, right? Um, so, Going along with all this, we have full integration with Mesos' built-in Authn and AuthC, so you can set up your ACLs to make sure that you know, only certain users are able to access this functionality. It's also integrated with DCOS's fine-grained ACL support as well, so you, know, you can make sure that only limited users have the ability to exec into the processes that they own and the tasks that they launch themselves. Um, and yeah, so you, you know, that authorization is all set up and, 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 and available if you decide to use it. Um, so what I want to do now is sort of demo how you can use this, and like like we mentioned before, we have an interactive session coming at the end of this where you can you know you can kind of rerun through this, these exact set of steps yourself to to play around with some of the support. Um, but what I basically want to show is that you know how you can bring up a vanilla nginx doc, Docker container, run it through Marathon, make sure that nothing's serving on um, the port that's been allocated to Nginx. So by default, Nginx is launched with port 80 set up. So I don't change anything about Nginx. I just launch it. It tries to connect on port 80, but that's not the port that Mesos has allocated to it, right? So uh, what I then do is say, okay, well, I'm going to try and figure out what's wrong. I start an interactive session with Nginx's container. And once I'm, once I'm inside that container, I update the port that Nginx listens on. I restart Nginx, and then I should be able to go to the web page and see that it's launched, right? Because the port is now actually, or Nginx is now running with the port that Mesos has allocated to it. Um, I pre-recorded this demo. It's actually, I, I usually give a longer version of this talk. This is a very stripped down uh, version of it. And so this is kind of a, a clipped <laughs> version of the video from a talk that I've given in the past. Uh, so there might be a few commands at the beginning that look confusing because it's kind of going from the flow of, you know, the, the, the other steps that I usually give when I, when I go through this. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and start this. Um, and the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually set up my cluster to point to a DCOS cluster, and I'm going to log into it. Uh, so, you know, by default, whenever you launch a DCOS cluster, the, the first user, the default user you get is called bootstrap user. You type in the password for that, and now you're logged in to that cluster, so you can start deploying things on it and playing around with it. So once, uh, once I'm logged in, um, next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take an Nginx container that I have. Uh, well, I guess first I'm going to show that you know, there's no services running on this thing right now, right? This is a vanilla cluster. Nothing's running on it. There's no services at all. Uh, and you know, now I'm going to deploy this Nginx container. So uh, I have this nginx.json file that I've sort of pre-created for this. Um, if you looked through the, uh, the contents of it, um, let's see here. Yeah, so I'm opening it up. Uh, you can see that I've got the, the name of it is going to be called nginx demo. So when we go to the UI and look at this, you'll, you'll see that reflected in there. Uh, the container type is Mesos. So I'm going to use the Mesos or unified containerizer to launch this. Um, it's just the vanilla Nginx uh, Docker image that you can get from Docker Hub. Uh, the command I'm going to launch, again, just for demonstration purposes, is some long sleep command so that this thing will come up and stay running forever. Um, and then I'm going to give it you know, 0.2 CPUs, and I'm going to run a single instance of this, and then I want it to run on a public node so that I can you know, actually access the uh, IP address and get to the port from, from that on, the, on, the, on a public node rather than something private inside the cluster. <clears throat> I could have also set up Marathon LB uh, the same way Gaston showed earlier, but for the purposes of this demo, that, that wasn't really necessary. <clears throat> so yeah, so the next step is to basically take that JSON and deploy it on the cluster. So I've got this uh, command here uh, that you can execute from the DCOS CLI to go ahead and deploy that. So you see that the deployment's been created. And uh, I can go back to the UI, and I see that it's running now, right? So Nginx demo, you can click through it, and you see that it's running. And Gaston talked about the health checks. You can see that it's uh, already healthy. Now, what I, can do, what I do now is I come in, and I look at what the endpoint that it thinks it has for that cluster is, right? Or sorry, not for that cluster, for, for this application. This is the endpoint on a private IP address uh, on the port that's been allocated to it. So there's obviously two things wrong with this. One, it's a private IP. There's no way for me to be able to get to that um, from, from my local laptop. Uh, and then the second one is that that's not port 80. Nginx thinks that it needs to be running on, or thinks that it's running on port 80, and that's not what's been allocated to it. 
So, <clears throat> so how can I deal with this? So first thing I want to do is I want to get the public IP of this node so that I can you know, actually navigate to it, right? So uh, we have a, uh, because we're running on, um, on AWS, I'm going to be able to hit the metadata server to figure out what my public IP is, right? This is a standard URL you can hit inside uh, AWS on AWS machines and uh, uh, so that you can get the public IP. So what happened here actually was I tried to run this. I tried to use this DCOS task exec command that I've now added, but what ended up happening was curl wasn't installed on that box. So, so what do I do? How do I, how do I deal with this? So instead of trying to run that command directly, I'll now jump into a bash shell using task exec. I'll run apt get update, and I'll install curl, right? So you can, you know, kind of, you can, it just kind of shows the power of being able to jump in to the containers the same way you would have with something like uh, docker exec. So I install curl. Once curl gets installed, I can now, from this interactive session, basically rerun the same command I tried to before. Uh, to get the public IP address of this node. Now, you know, this is kind of contrived. You probably know the public IP address of your node out of band of this. Um, but this is just kind of showing, you know, how you can use these tools to, to go and figure this out if you, if you need to. So I do that. I get my public IP. Everything's great. I try and go back to my UI to replace the private IP with the public one. And obviously, it still doesn't work because the port's wrong, right? So how do I deal with that? How do I go in and actually get this application up and running so that it's actually you know, running on that port. So, <clears throat> so if I go back to, uh, to my terminal, and I go back to the list of instructions, uh, you can see that, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm still inside the, the bash session, so I don't need to restart it. But so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to open up the Nginx's config file. Again, Vim doesn't happen to be installed, so I need to install Vim. Uh, so I can open the file. Once Vim's installed, I'm going to open up Nginx's default.conf file. Um, that should be coming in a second here once the, once the Vim install is done. <coughs> so I open up default.conf. I see that it's listening on port 80, as expected. And I'm going to change that now to the IP, or sorry, to the port that I've actually allocated to this application. Eighty-three There it is. Now I close that out. I come back. I restart Nginx. And I would say, let's hope the demo gods let this work. But because I recorded it, I know it works. <laughs> um, and when you refresh this page, uh, we should see you know, the welcome to Nginx sign come up. So there it is, and that's it for the demo. And uh, um, yeah, so let's see what else I have in the slides here. So yeah, so real quick, I just wanted to give special thanks to a lot of the people that helped us work on these various features that we've kind of demonstrated today. Um, you know, there's pieces that are involved with security to make sure that all the authorization stuff happens properly. There's people that put work into getting the different HTTP APIs for task exec put in there. I'm sure on the marathon side, there was a lot of people involved, more than Johannes, for, for getting some of that stuff working um, and so on. And also on the CLI bits that we had to put together. Um, so yeah, with that, does anyone have any questions about this or anything else? And you know, right after this, we'll jump into the, 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 the live interactive session with you guys so you can play around with some of these things. Yep. So the, so the question was, can you prohibit someone from execing into the container that they themselves have deployed? You could, if you want to. Yeah, it's, it's very fine-grained ACLs. You, you have to give them explicit permissions for hitting those APIs that, that, I, that we've added. So if they don't have permission to hit the launch as a container session API, they won't be able to do it, even though they have the create permissions for the container to begin with. Yep. Any other questions? OK, so we'll leave this slide up. But basically, we have a, a DCOS cluster up and running that you guys can navigate to and, and play around with. Um, the public agent that we have, so we, you know, I think Gaston mentioned the, the, the layout of this cluster. We've got five agents that are private and one public agent. And we're running Marathon LB on that public agent. If you wanted to deploy that Nginx container that I showed you before, you can deploy that on this public agent. It'll happen automatically by putting the slave public constraint um, but that's where it'll land in case you need the IP address. Um, we have a set of uh, user accounts that we've created underneath the students group. 
Uh, the username for that is user one through 40. Uh, I don't know the best way to allocate that out to you guys, but <laughs> you can try and log in with one and uh, see if you're unique on there. And if you don't care about other people messing with your environment, then, uh, then you can switch to another one. Um, and then we have a gist with all of the scripts and JSON for all the different things that we, that we showed during this presentation. So you can you know, deploy those yourself and see how all this works. So yeah, that's it. There's no other questions. Uh, th me, Philip, Gaston, and Johannes will be around for you know any questions that you have as you're going through this stuff yourself. So thanks again. <laughs>